Oh, we give you praise, we give you praise, we give you praise. We magnify, we glorify, we lift up your holy, wonderful name. Lord Jesus, it is you we sing about tonight. It is you we glorify, it is you we magnify. We bless your holy, wonderful name, Lord Jesus. We thank you for being so present here with us uh, this evening. We thank you that you are here to meet us at the point of our need. For you have ordained it that on a night like this, a Friday service, Lord, you are here to meet us at the point of our need. And you know that we have needs, Lord Jesus. We thank you that we can come to you, that we can sit at your feet, listen to your word, that faith will arise in our heart. For you have said it, Lord, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so, precious God, we thank you. We thank you for a night like this. We thank you for every need that would be met tonight. And for it, we give you all the glory, all the honor, all the praise, and all the thanks. Come on, saints of God, put your hands together. Come on, let's glorify him. Let's glorify him. He's worthy. He's worthy. Worthy of praise. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. 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 You know, if Brian Lara walked inside here tonight, you all would be so excited. Huh? Those of you who are cricketers. But this is Jesus we are talking about. This is the King of Glory. Come on, put your hands together and let him know that you love him, you praise him, you worship him. Hallelujah. Why do we have to beg you to praise this great, great God? Hallelujah. Come on. It makes you feel good when you praise him. You release the energy from your spirit. The spiritual combustion in the place. Come on. Hallelujah. Shout it out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Come on. He's a good, good God. We sang about his greatness. He's a great, great God. We sang about how big he is. He's a big, big God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise. Don't you feel a little better now? You feel a little better? Okay, we're going to feel a lot more better. Come on, put your hands together again for the King of Kings and the Lord of all lords. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Party cake, party cake, baker's man. Come on. Come on, come on. He is worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. God bless you richly. Now you can have your seats. Hallelujah. Oh, we serve such a wonderful, gracious, majestic God. And his name is? Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of John, chapter 6. Hello? Hello? I'm here. It's not there. Thank you. A little more. John chapter 6. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Amen. Isn't it refreshing when you have to meet all those mad taxi drivers on the road? Then you read all about the criminals, what they're doing, how many people they're killing. And then you read about the politicians. Oh, God, praise God for Jesus. Thank God we can come into a house like this and praise the name of the Lord. 
shut off the world and embrace it, Jesus. John chapter 6, starting from verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that was diseased. Oh, that was no reason to follow Jesus. He is worthy to be followed only because he is Jesus. Amen. It's like today, you know, people want to follow after prophecy. They want to follow after miracles, but they don't want to follow after Jesus. Same thing here. And a great multitude follow him. Why? Because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover feast of the Jews was nigh. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come with him, he said unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred pennyworth of bread is not sufficient for them, and every one of them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, There is a lad here which had five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in numbers about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were sat down. And likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets, full with baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. Let's just visualize the scene. Here was a multitude of people, men, 5,000 of them. And they were hungry. And Jesus, Jesus asked Philip, where are we going to get bread to feed all these people? But the end of the story is that they all ate out of five barley loaves and two small fishes. They all ate, and they gathered afterwards 12 baskets full of remnants. After 5,000 people ate out of five barley loaves and two small fishes. This is a miracle. And there is something about this miracle that we need to know tonight. The miracle of feeding of the 5,000 men is recorded in all four Gospels. Matthew records it, Mark records it, Luke records it, and John records it. And while all the miracles performed by Jesus are remarkable, and I want to say they all are remarkable indeed, the significance of this particular miracle points to Jesus as, and I'm going to enumerate them now, one, the bread of life. It points to Jesus as the bread of life, the one who provides for body as well as a soul. Ironically, we just sang about my provider, Jehovah Jireh. We must never think that Jesus is only interested in our spiritual lives. Sometimes we may think that way. He's only concerned about our spiritual growth and development. But not at all. This is not so. His concern is always about the whole man. 
every aspect of our being. Spirit, soul, and body. He is concerned about the whole man. Spirit, soul, and body. Not just the spirit, not just the soul, but the body as well. We see it here. The men were hungry, 5,000 of them, and he did something to satisfy their physical need for their bodies. So he is concerned about our bodies as well. Number two, it is the proof of Jesus' power to perform miracles which makes him a deity. I mean, who else but God can take five loaves, two small fishes, feed 5,000 people, and have 12 basketful of remnants remaining. Only God. So it is proof of Jesus' power to perform miracles which makes him deity. And many dispute the fact today that he is deity. He is limited to being a great teacher to some, a prophet to others, and a martyr by many religious folk around the world. But I am here to affirm tonight that he is deity. He is God. He is God come in the flesh to redeem sinful man from their sins. Jesus Christ is Lord and God. I remember ministering to my sister who had been saved many, many years after me, before me rather. And I was making the point of Jesus being God. And she says, you know, I never knew Jesus was God. But how else can we save, be saved? He is God, and we must identify him as such. He is the brightness of the glory of God and the express image of his person. He is God manifest in the form of man as the Son of Man. So that this is one of the significances of this particular miracle, because only God can perform miracles. It is only God who can do these things which he did while he was here on the earth. And after 2,000 years, it is only God that can bring about the kind of change in your life and my life. I don't know too much about you where this is concerned, but I know it is only God that could have done what he has done with me. Only God. I remember when I got saved, I went up to the States where my mother was, and I started to minister to her about the things of God. She was saved, of course, and she, she had been praying for me all my life, you know, and the more she prayed, the worse I got. And when I started talking to her about Jesus, she just kept staring at me and saying, it is only God. It is only God. And believe me, it is only God that can have me here today. The third thing is the performance of this miracle is an example of his compassion. Listen to me carefully. It is an example of his compassion for needy people. For in each of the Gospels, it is re recorded on seeing the multitudes hungry, he had compassion on them. We are speaking about a compassionate Christ. And if you are here tonight and you have a situation, you have it before him and it seems that he's not caring because the answer is not forthcoming, know by the word of God that this God that we serve is a compassionate God. We may say tonight that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he was compassionate, then he's compassionate now, and he will always be compassionate. Number four, it teaches that the little we have, when put in the master's hand, he can do so much with it. The little that we have, when put into his hand, with a little prayer by him, oh, he can do so much with it. And we see this in this miracle of feeding the multitudes. But that's not the message, you know. There is something in this account in John 
that is not mentioned in any other of the Gospels that speak about this particular miracle. Something that is worthy of taking note. Here we see Jesus. He have crossed the Sea of Tiberias. A great multitude followed him according to the word of God. We know from the account that there were 5,000 men. Now stay with me and let's make it real. Let's make it alive. Visualize. Imagine. Let your imaginations run away with you. 5,000 men sitting at the feet of Jesus and they were hungry. This was not the occasion where the 4,000 men beside the woman were concerned. This is another situation. Jesus went up into the mountain where he sat down with his disciples and he was teaching. The Bible says, and lifting up his eyes, he saw this multitude. 5,000, listen, 5,000 people sitting and staring at you is a lot of people. Lifting up his eyes, he saw this multitude of men come unto him and recognizing that they had gone all day without food because they were with him, they were following him wherever he was going. He was teaching and they were intent on listening. He had them captivated by what he was saying. And they refused to go their way even though they were hungry. So the Bible says he had compassion of them, on them and he asked Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Jesus asking Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But look at the next verse. Verse 6 tells us that he said this to prove Philip. For he himself knew what he will do. I want you to get a hold of that because that is the message God has sent for you tonight. He asked Philip. Where are we going to get food, bread, to feed these 5,000 people? And verse 6 tells us, he said this only to prove Philip, for he knew, he himself knew what he will do. Like so many of us today, Philip did not realize that he was undergoing a test of faith by Jesus. Philip did not realize that he was undergoing a test of faith by Jesus. Just like you and just like me today, when things untoward happen to us, we tend to focus only on the situation. We tend to look at the way out, but we never look to see that it is Jesus who might very well be testing our faith. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a while. Philip had seen Jesus perform many miracles before their very eyes. He had seen them. He was there when Jesus opened blind eyes. He was there when Jesus unstopped deaf ears. He was there when Jesus made the dumb to talk, the lame to walk. He was there when Jesus... Heal the lepers, something that could not have been done. It was an incurable disease. Still is. And Jesus healed one, then he healed 12. Philip was there as a disciple, watching Jesus perform miracles. All these were supernatural feats. They were supernatural feats accomplished by Jesus, he being God come in the flesh as the Son of Man. And to Philip, in spite of all that, he completely lost sight of all these miraculous deeds that Jesus had done. Just with a question, 
to test him. He completely forgot all the miracles that Jesus did. Just like you and just like me, there is the tendency when a situation develops in our lives that we fail to look back and see what God has done in times past. Oh, I have preached about this so many times because we are guilty of it. We keep our focus on the situation and not on what God has done, understanding that he's the same God that we serve. Philip completely lost sight of all the miraculous deeds, and he answered Jesus saying, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient, Lord, that every one of them may take a little We take our eyes off the miracle worker and we put it on the situation a little too much. We are going to see later on what transpired. What is noteworthy in this account, however, is the fact that even though Jesus asked Philip where shall we buy bread that we may eat, that these may eat? We are told that Jesus already knew what he will do. I want you tonight, if you are here and there is a situation before God, there is a need in your life. So much so that you are praying to God about it. I want you to take careful note of this statement. That Jesus already knew what he will do when he asked Peter, where are we going to find bread to feed these multitudes? He already knew. He already knew what he will do. And tonight the Lord Jesus wants us to know. Not just to know, but to understand that there are situations, there is no situation, no circumstance, no difficulty that we can face that he doesn't already know what to do about it. Already knows. Not only does he know what to do about it, but that he has already done. He has already done something about your problem. He has already done it. You say, Pastor, how can you come to that? Listen, we may be surprised whenever something suddenly happens to us, but God is never surprised. God is not surprised. Don't we preach? Haven't we read? Don't we know? Don't we understand that he is the omniscient God? What does omniscient mean? It means that he knows all things. We preach, we read that he is the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the ending. The genesis and the revelation. He is not limited to time. He is a timeless God. He walks up and down the corridors of eternity. Are you getting what I'm saying to you tonight? There is no time or place that God is not. If you live to be a million years old, God has already gone down that road and went beyond that into eternity and back. He's not the product of time. He's a timeless God. He is the one that created the beginning. He knew no beginning. He always was. There was no time that he was not. Oh, our finite minds cannot comprehend this, but it is a fact. 
and he knows everything. Even before things happen, he knows about them. Not only does he know about them, but he has prepared things to take us, take care of us when we get into that time and place. Is this the God that you serve? We must try. We must try with all. We must ask the Lord. Lord, help us. We know that you are beyond our understanding, but help us to understand a little of your attributes. When it comes to omniscience, when it comes to being everywhere present at the same time, and if we could understand that to a little degree, it will take a lot of pressure off of our shoulders when we are faced with a situation. We can know from the word of God that whatever is happening to us now, Jesus already knows what he is going to do. And not only does he know what he is going to do, but he does the thing. He's not waiting on us. He does it. And is waiting for us to come into that place and point in time when we can receive the thing. This is why he tells us in Mark, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you have Received it. Well, how can you receive something that is not? It means that he has already done the thing. And all he requires of us is not to doubt, but to believe. And we will come into that place and point in time when we can receive. Why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> like if you don't believe me. Well, I happen to believe what I preach. I happen to believe that there is no circumstance in my life that took God by surprise. I happen to believe, although I did not understand it then, I happen to believe that while I was going through my stuff and I was crying out to him, he had gone ahead of me, prepared the thing so that I will walk into it in my time and in his time. This is the God that we serve. I am kind of ahead of myself. I have a testimony to give all you tonight. So he's the omniscient God. He's all-knowing. He's a timeless God. He's not limited to time and space. We must know that he has dealt with problems already that we have, that we have before him. We are there. We are, why God doesn't answer our prayer? But who said he didn't answer? Not only has he answered, but he has done it. Are we going to call him a liar? Did he not say in Jeremiah, call unto me and I will answer you? Did he not say that? Did he not say, and I will show you great and mighty things which you don't know now, but you're going to know it then? when you come into that place and point in time. Because it's already done. When Jesus was on the cross, he said, it is finished. The work is done. The work is done. We only have to come into that place and point in time. Oh, I don't want to... Listen. Oh, God, help me with this, please. God says, if you do what I say, and you observe to do all the things that I command, he says, blessings will follow you and will overtake you. Do you know what that means? It means that the blessings are already in place. They are there. And as you do what he says, and you walk that road of blessing, 
the blessings are going to start following you because they are there waiting for you to come on the road. They are there waiting. And as you get on the road of blessing, they begin to follow you. And not only follow you, but they move from in behind you and get in front of you. That is what it means to overtake you. But there. And he also says, if you don't do what you are supposed to do, that curses will follow you and overtake you. That doesn't mean that God will curse you. No, he's a good, good God. But the road of curses, the curses are there. And if you get on that road, they are going to follow you just as the blessings would, and they will overtake you. You read it. Where is it found? In Deuteronomy 28. Read it. Read it. They are there. So what I'm saying is because he's the omniscient God, he's everywhere present at the same time, walking up and down the corridors of eternity, knowing all things before they happen. When we cry out, he answers. He places the thing that we have been praying for there. Now all we have to do is to get into the point and place in time, in his time, and the blessing will be there. A lot of you may believe that God started blessing you because you accept Jesus as your Savior. No. 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 I am testim I, I am a testimony of that fact. I have told this church before this. There was that time in my life. I was a sinner of note. A noteworthy sinner. I used to do everything wrong, contrary to God. I didn't have God in my mind. Okay, so it caught up with me one day. How many of you know sinners catch up with you? Yes, before, be sure your sins will find you out. That's the word of God. So my sins found me out, and I was in a situation on my bedroom floor with a half bottle of scotch, half only because I drank the first half. And I was drinking, bloop, 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 and bawling to high heavens about what was happening to me. I mean, I was screaming. And sinner that I was, I heard. And God is my witness tonight. I heard in my spirit, you do not understand what is happening to you now. But one day, you will praise me for it. Well, how could God tell me that if he had not already gone ahead of me and prepared what I would praise him for long before I got there? It took years because hearing that, I thought I was thinking it. But today I understand. Today I understand what God said to me when I was on that floor, pistolatically drunk, <laughs> crying out to him. How many of you know that's when we cry out to God? Not when we pistolatically <laughs> drunk, eh? when we are in trouble. <laughs> crying out to him. He said, you do not understand now but one day you will. Brothers and sisters, this is the day that the Lord has made. Now I understand what he had already planned for me. What he had already done. It was a finish. It was a done deal. And he was just waiting for me to get to that place and point in time. And look what the Lord has done. And what I was crying about has died since. And look what the Lord has given me. He knew that. 
He knew that. He's an all-knowing God. He's omniscient. What is your problem tonight? It caught God by surprise, right? Oh gosh, he's shaking. How are we going to handle that? Yes, he asked Philip, where are we going to find bread to satisfy this multitude? But he knew what he will do. It was only a test to test the faith of Philip. He had seen many miracles. Have you ever seen God work in your life in miraculous ways? Let me see your hands. Okay, everybody raise their hand. Okay, so when a situation arises and we hear him say, Fear not. Why are we fearful? Why are we allowing fear and worry to grip our hearts when we know that he is the same God today as he was yesterday and he will be the same God tomorrow? Yes, I know at the point in time we are human and we are going to feel how but God wants to bring us beyond that. He wants us to understand that we are not just human. We are supernatural human beings because within us is a supernatural spirit, the very spirit of God. So we can embrace these thoughts. And this is why he sends the word so that our faith will be built up so that we can accept when a situation faces us, we can know that God is going to come through for us. It's only a matter of time. And if we know that, then the worry and the fear should disappear. You heard on Sunday, I told you, I'll tell you again. It's a testimony. We left our yellow fever papers at home. We landed in Bangalore airport. No yellow fever. They wouldn't let us in. Get back on the plane. Two options. Back on the plane or four days in quarantine. Well, I know about quarantine for dog and animals and things. Why are you sending me in quarantine? Look at a big healthy man like me carrying about the spirit of God in me. And you tell me about quarantine for a little mosquito? But then, being a heathen country, they have nothing to do with God and what you come here for. As a matter of fact, we can't even tell them what we come here for. So, Plane gone already, and we weren't going back in any event. Six hours in the, house, in, the, in the airport. They took us. First, it was supposed to be an ambulance. Imagine your pastor going down the road in India in an ambulance to go in with them. Quarantine. And I have my poor wife. And you know, it's her birthday, boy. <laughs> It's her birthday. Huh? Oh, by the way, today is our 26th anniversary. Thank God we could spend it here today. Two years ago, we were in India for her anniversary. Why is all this wait for something happening to you first? Anyway. <laughs> Put us in a taxi. Praise God because the ambulance is taking long to come. Give the taxi driver our passport and all the papers to get us to a hospital. And I am thinking, well, Bangalore Airport has been done over. It's new. So, you know, it's, it's real nice. Eh? So I'm, I'm visualizing a beautiful hospital, you know. <laughs> Man, listen, I wouldn't let my dogs stay there. If you see how nasty the place is. But that's beside the point. So we go in in the vehicle. And all I am thinking is, I have come here for a purpose. And the first four days is the time when I am needed most in the conference. How am I going to be here in this hospital for four days? The very four days when it is the most important days down there. 
my wife is so wonderful. She, she knows God, you know. This woman knows God. Because when I am only thinking about what I am putting her in, all she says is, babe, don't worry. God ain't going to leave us in this place. God will not leave us in this place. We're not staying here tonight. And all I've seen is I'm watching these two little bed in this nasty place. And then some phone calls were made. And then the chief medical officer of Bangalore calls the person that is holding us. He's a good gentleman. And I'm hearing him on the phone. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. All right, sir. Very well, sir. All right, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, you all could go. <laughs> <laughs> Two hours instead of a four days. We have a friend. You have a friend in high, high places. You have a friend in high, high. No, let's get back to the message. When I left Trinidad without the yellow fever certificate, did not Jesus know that? Couldn't he have said, son, or bro? <laughs> oh, he's our brother, you know. Yes, he's our brother. He could have said, bro, you're leaving. Your, your... I said, oops, pick it up. No, he let me walk out with it, fly out with it. Don't you think that he knew that we were going to be held up in the airport? Yes. Don't you think he knew that we would be, have to go to quarantine? He's omniscient. He knows all things. But just as he did with Philip, he said to Philip, where are we going to buy bread to feed all these people? But he knew what he will do. And when we left the Trinidad without the yellow fever certificate, he knew... Oh, you're not getting this. He already knew what he will do. I thank God for my wife, who I was thinking, why am I passing you through this? And don't worry, babes. Everything is going to be okay. We're not staying here tonight. I don't know if she was just saying that to help me out. <laughs> but guess what? We did not stay the night. What I'm trying, and I move away from the message. Eh? You would notice that. You've done with that long time, you know. <laughs> but I'm giving you the message. But what God wants us to know is that he's all-knowing. What's happening to you tonight if you have a need before him? If you have a situation, a circumstance, a difficulty that you are faced with, regardless of what it may be, whether it be social, whether it be mental, whether it be financial, whether it be physical, he knows everything about us. Jesus says, even the hairs on our head are numbered. Not one will fall off without the Father's knowledge. Thank God it has some bald head people that God don't have to bother about. <laughs> you know? <laughs> he knows all things. He asked the question, are two sparrows sold for a penny? How much more we are of those sparrows. Do you know that God loves you? That he cares for you? He's compassionate about what's happening to you? But just as he did with Philip, just as he did with 
me. He allows things to test us. Where, are our faith, where is our faith going to lie? Jesus said, I quoted the scripture in the book of Mark, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you have received it because it's already there. All we have to do is to get into that place and point in time when it will be revealed to us. Isn't that what Hebrews says? Hebrews 11. Now faith is the substance. It's a real thing. It takes the place of the commodity, so to speak. Faith is the substance of what we are hoping for, the evidence we have not yet seen. But it is by faith we are going to get hold of it. When we continue believing, irrespective of, irregard, re, oh, there's no such word, irregard, regardless of, there's a, there's a word, irregardless. <laughs> it sounds wrong, you know. Irre, oh yes, irregardless. Okay, thank you. We must know the God that we serve. We must know that we know that we know that he is able. No, don't know that. He is more than able. More than enough. He is not just enough. He is more than enough. We are like Philip now with your situation. You are like Philip. You're looking at the natural. Where are we going to find bread? 200 penny worth of bread. Jesus is way beyond you. He's way beyond the natural. He's a supernatural God. He is able to go ahead of our, even our thoughts and provide the very thing. All we have got to do is to hold on to him. Walk with him. Be faithful to him. And he will bring us into that place. Is that not what he says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? That we are to trust him with some of our heart. Trust him with a portion of our heart. With about half of our heart. He says trust him with all your heart. Don't lean to your own understanding. Son, that's your problem. You are leaning to your own understanding. You're trying to figure out things. You're, trying, you're wondering why and when and if. You just believe in the God that you, that you serve, that he is more than able. We're going through a test. You're going through a test like Philip. Jesus was testing Philip's faith. Where are we going to get bread to give this multitude of people. But he knew already what he was going to do. God knows what he's going to do in your life. He knows what he's going to do in all our lives. Nothing is going to take him by surprise. The problem is sometimes we hinder the answer to the prayer by being contrary to his word. And listen, God doesn't spoil us, you know. He loves us, but he, doesn't, he spoils us only when we're now saved and we're like a baby in his arm. But you see, when we start to grow up, he don't spoil us. No. If you want to throw a tantrum and ball and kick and don't do what he says, he would leave you there, ball, kick, throw your tantrum. tantrum. He's not going to... Oh, Oh, gosh, I'm sorry for you. No, that's not compassion. That's not compassion. He's a compassionate God. He cares for you. He cares about your hurts. He cares about your pain. He knows all that's happening to you, and he has done something about it. All we have to do is to make sure and walk that road, and he will get you there. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 Trust in him with all your heart. 
Don't lean to your own understanding. Just acknowledge him. Be faithful. Be honorable where his word is concerned. Walk in obedience to his word. And he says, he is going to direct your path to the very thing that you have got before him. This is the God that we serve. Tell him we're not here tonight. <laughs> you have a need. You really believe. You really believe this God is able. Do you believe that he is more than he able? That he is Jehovah Jireh, your provider? Do you really believe that? Well, let us stand it tonight. And if you have a need, if you have a need, he has the answer. It's waiting there for us. Maybe it might be met right here at the altar. There are times when he does it like that. Because you are now in the place, now in the time for him to touch that need. But if he does not touch it tonight, know that it is already there, planned for you, put down for you, just waiting for you to come into that time and place to receive your need. Come on, put your hands together for the Lord. <laughs> Even as you sing, if you have a need tonight, don't, don't stay there. This is the place. This is the place he's going to meet you at the point of your need. These are the services that are designed for this specific purpose. Don't wait until we finish saying, come before the Lord with your need. Come on. Sorry about that. Come on.
Hallelujah. Praise you, wonderful Savior, glorious God, eternal Master and King. We have preached your word straight out of the Gospels. Just as you did it while you were here upon the earth 2,000 years ago, you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And before you are your people, Lord, with your needs. People who choose to believe that our God can supply all our needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I trust, O oh God, that it will be a people who believe what you have said through your manservant in the book of Peter that we are to cast our cares upon you, for you do care for us. Cause them to know, Lord, beyond any shadow of doubt that you care for them. The message this evening is that Philip was put to the test of his faith. Just as we, your people today, are being tested by you, testing our faith, will we look back and see your miraculous hand in our lives? Will we look back and see the things that you have done when we wondered how it could ever be done, but it has been done and we glorify you for it? Could they look back and see and know that you are the same God today as you were yesterday and that you will be so on forever because you are a God that does not change? If they would come to grips with this, Lord, I pray tonight that they would embrace the word embrace the thought that they are going through a time of test and they would come through with flying colors when they would choose to believe your word not doubting but knowing Lord that whatever they've got before you you have already walked into the future because you have that capacity being not limited to time and you have already secured the answer to the problem to the need to the difficulty to whatever it is you have already laid it down it is done it's a done deal because where they are now they are wondering how when where and possibly why but lord you already knew what you will do. Cause them to know that they need not know about the how, the when, or the why. They have just got to embrace the who. And if you are that who, then precious Lord, I know, I know that in your timing, as they walk with you, that precious Lord, you will direct their path to the very place and point of their need. And we thank you for it. As I touch them, Lord, I pray that my hand will be an extension of your hand. That my hand would only be a conduit through which your power, Lord, will touch your people and go beyond their doubts, go beyond their understandings, and cause them to know tonight, Lord, that you are on their case, you are attending, you are attending to the thing that they have been praying and praying about, that it is a done deal, Lord. Oh, precious God and Father, may they have the faith to receive without seeing. May they have the faith to understand that you can walk up and down the corridors of time and accomplish, Lord, what they have got need of even before they have got there 
to receive it. We bless your holy, wonderful name, Lord Jesus. Touch them, Lord. Touch them tonight. Touch them and give them the assurance that you are handling their matter. It's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. Touch them, Lord. Touch them, Lord. Only a matter of time, even as they walk in your ways, Lord. Not in their own ways. Not in their own understanding. But in your ways, Lord. Oh, precious God and Father, I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that you are able, Lord, to go beyond their own understanding, that you are able to go beyond their own doubts, Lord, that where they are limited, where we are limited, you are an unlimited God. Oh, precious God and Father, touch them, Lord. Touch them, Lord. Touch them, Lord. Touch her, Lord. Touch her at the point of her need Lord I pray in the name of Jesus and son the Lord will say unto you you lean too much on your own understanding that you're trying to figure God out but he's too big for little you to figure him out all you have to do is like a child lay in his hands trust him and he says he will direct your path quit doubting quit questioning just believe and he will direct your path touch her lord i pray in the name of jesus cause her to see where you have brought her from to where she is now and know that you are taking her on a journey and you already know what you will do oh we give you praise and glory thank you lord to touch her Touch her tonight at the point of her need in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Oh, precious God and Father, all the struggles. I pray, Lord, that he will just surrender so totally to you that his troubles, Lord, would seem so far away just resting in your arms. Oh, God, we pray for a divine touch tonight. Touch your daughter, Lord. Touch her, Lord, we pray. Touch her, Lord, we pray. Go beyond her natural understanding. She's figuring and she's figuring. She's trying to figure out. She's trying to figure out this great, great God, how he's going to do something. Daughter, the Lord is saying to you tonight, even if you had him figured out, he will do it a different way. So don't try to figure him out. Praise you, wonderful Savior and God. Thank you, Jesus. Touch him, Lord. Touch her, Lord. Touch her, Lord, at the point of her need. Cause her to know from whence she have fallen and cause her to know that your arms are outstretched to receive her and restore her. And to bless her for your love has been placed upon her. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Thank you, wonderful Savior and God. Thank you for the manifestation of your spirit at this altar tonight. That precious Lord, that by faith we can receive every need that we have petitioned you for. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Come on, put your hands together for the Lord. Come on. Believe that you have already received it and you shall have that which you believe. That's the word of God. Hallelujah. You're only being tested. Hallelujah. Come on, let's sing this chorus.
is a faithful God. He is indeed a faithful God. A good, good God, a big, big God, a great, great God, a faithful God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being who you are. Oh, how we pray that if there is one person in this congregation tonight who are yet to know you as Savior and Lord, that your spirit, oh God, will so move on their hearts, tugging them, tugging them from the gates of destruction to put them on the road to life. We pray it in Jesus' name. And if you're here tonight, you don't know this Jesus that we preach about. This Jesus that is able to save to the uttermost everyone that would believe on him. You're here tonight and you don't know him in a personal way. You don't know that his spirit resides in you. This could only happen if you are born of his spirit. And this is the opportunity you can have now to experience the most wonderful thing that you can ever experience here upon earth. To know that the Spirit of God comes into you when the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all sin. You're here tonight and you have never had that experience of being born of the Spirit of God. Just raise your hand right where you are. We will help you with a prayer and you will come into this most miraculous experience. Is there one here tonight? Is there one? Yes, sir, I see your hand. Praise God for you. God has an appointment with you tonight. Is there another? Is there another that will join this gentleman and say, Jesus, I am a sinner because your word says all have sinned and come short of your glory. Jesus, I know you died for me and I believe that you rose from the dead. The Bible says, if you confess this, you shall be saved. Any other? Sir, would you come and meet me down here? I'll help you with a prayer. We talked about miracles, the miracle working power of Jesus. We talked about blind eyes being open, deaf ears being unstopped, lame people walking, dumb people talking, lepers being cleansed. All that we talked about, it's all in the Word of God. But guess what? You see what's going to happen to you tonight is, a, is the greater of all those miracles. To be born of the Spirit of God, you walked in here a sinner, you walked back out a child of God, a saint separated from sin because the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you if, if you handle it right. It's the heart condition and it's a mouth thing. If you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, that's where the action is. Okay? You ready? You ready to be changed? He's going to change you, you know? He changed me, changed all those people, changing millions around the world. Okay, say this, bro. Forget about everything. Forget about me. Forget about... Just think about Jesus who died for you. He loves you so very much. You're going to make a confession. You're going to pray it out. And you're going to really mean this with all your heart. Dear God in heaven, I come to you tonight, a sinner in need of a redeemer. I believe with all my heart that you, Jesus, died for me. I believe with all my heart that you, Jesus, rose from the dead. And I now accept you, Jesus, as my Savior, I confess you, Jesus, as my Lord. 
Lord Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart. Put your spirit in me and teach me to live for you. By faith, I receive you into my heart, Lord Jesus. And I thank you for saving me. Amen. And it's done. It's done. All you have to do now is, like a baby, desire the sincere milk of the word. You know how babies hold on to the mother's breast and just draw? Well, that's how God feeds us as little babes with the word of God. And we are right here to help you to grow and develop as God will have you. Okay? So we're going to start you off with a nurse right now. A man, a nurse. He's going to take you and he's going to start you off. Keep this appointment. Okay? God bless you. Come on, put your hands together. Thank you. Hallelujah. Okay, God bless you.